Matt Nowell. I'm the eBSD product manager. Uh, I'll be presenting with Renee Declo, who's our eBSD applications guru. Uh, we're very excited today to be talking about the evolution and revolution in eBSD pattern detection technology. Uh, I'll be covering the evolution part, and Renee will be covering the revolutionary part. So we're, we're very excited to present this. So on the evolution part, I'm going to be talking about the Velocity camera, which is our high-speed CMOS camera. And then Renee will be following up with the direct electron detector camera, our clarity camera, to talk a little bit about uh, CMOS and how it compares to traditional uh, CCD technology. In the end, both technologies use silicon as the photodiode material to convert the light that's generated from the phosphor screen into electrons uh, in the detection system. So CCDs generally use a single readout amplifier, sometimes a double. So when our charge comes in, it's shifted into a, a row, brought down to uh, the amplifier and rings out one row at a time. There's an A to D to converter that changes this into a digital signal into the image. And this produces high quality, low noise images with consistent amplification in each pixel. And this is important because each, each pixel goes through the single amplifier. And this limits the maximum readout speed. We're somewhere around 20 to 40 megahertz. And it allows signal binning or summation of charge before the amplification process. And the binning improves the sensitivity of the system and the readout speed by using fewer pixels when they're binned that we typically call super pixels. So this is just an example where we see full resolution patterns, 2x2 two two and 4x4 four four binning, how the resolution uh, decreases but the intensity increases. And so we can get good signal and noise as the amplification noise occurs only once in the readout process. For CMOS, there's a slight difference. So each pixel in the CMOS array has its own dedicated amplifier. That means there's no need to wait for each pixel to be uh, transferred to the amplifier. We get faster readout speeds uh, at full resolution, full imaging resolution of the detector. Because each uh, pixel has its own amplifier, uh, there's a little bit of variation that needs to be calibrated. And for signal binning, we don't have uh, the summation of charge before readout. So as we, as we do binning, we don't get uh, a single readout noise for, for a super pixel. We get noise at each pixel, but the readout noise is lower with our CMOS sensor. But the binning in this case does not affect the readout speed of the chip. We can get high speed at full resolution, but we can use binning to reduce the amount of information that's transferred into the PC for faster throughput. When we talk about the entire system, it's a little bit beyond just the sensor. For high-speed operation, the entire system itself is optimized. So the phosphor screen has been uh, optimized with a, with a material that's for high signal intensity and low decay times for high-speed operation. Uh, the lens has been customized for high throughput, high sensitivity, and low distortion. The sensor itself has been optimized for high sensitivity, low noise, high-speed operation. And the software to analyze all this has been multi-threaded for band detection, indexing, and image processing to allow uh, operation at high speeds. One of the biggest advantages of going to uh, CMOS um, high-speed operation is that at the pixels, that the high speeds we use, the pixel resolution is higher. So this is an example. On the left of that pattern, that's a pattern from the CMOS velocity at 4,500 patterns per second, you can see the number of pixels. Compare that to a traditional CCD sensor, where at 1,400 or three times slower, we're operating only with 30 by 30 pixels. So visually, you can see you know, the, the, the pattern spatial resolution difference uh, quite a bit more. This allows us to have improved band detection, uh, higher indexing performance, and better orientation precision at the high speeds of operation. So this has all been rolled into a product that we call the Velocity. Uh, it comes in two different models. We have the Velocity Plus, which is, uh, operates up to 3,000 index points per second. And then we have the Velocity Super, which goes up to 4,500 index points per second. Really driven by the, the high-speed, low-noise CMOS sensor that's been customized for the EBSD operation. Uh, and again, it allows 120 by 120 pixel image resolution at those high speeds. 
So it's really an ideal detector for in situ and 3D experiments where you need the highest collection speeds, but the speeds are available for every day-to-day -day operation as well, which allows you to collect large data sets where the, the data collection strategies are now able to be optimized for different materials. So I'll try to show some examples of that. So I wanted to show some basic results. This is the Velocity Plus. This is at 3,000 index points per second at about 10 nanoamps with essentially a 100% indexing success rate. For those of you who aren't familiar with EBSD maps, the pattern quality on map on the left shows uh, basically the grain uh, contrast caused by the sharpness of the diffraction patterns. The image in the middle is from our Prius technology, which I'll explain later, but we can see the orientation changes uh, in an image. And on the right, we see the actual orientation maps where the color corresponds to crystallographic orientation. So we look at the three different colors, we show the three different orientations. So you generally see those with this colored triangle that, that correlates the orientation that we're looking at. We can jump to the Hikari Super. We can get the same type of results at 4,500 index points per second. Because we're going faster, we need a little bit more signal. So this is the case is about 25 nanoamps. And again, close to 100% indexing success rate on a material. Um, this is uh, a Inconel 600 nickel superalloy sample. We can get similar results on something like an additively manufactured Inconel, again a nickel alloy, but you can see the grain structure is quite a bit more complex. And we can do this on, in this case, a tantalum material, a body-centered cubic material. And this is just a little video to show the operation of the camera at high speeds. So this is collecting uh, a few thousand, ten, a few hundred thousand data points you can see the lifetime collection uh, from that, that additively manufactured nickel sample. We're collecting these at 120 by 120 pixel resolution. And it should right about now show me. In this case, we're getting just under 200,000 data points in just about 40 seconds. So for some scale, you know, this used to be an overnight type collection. Now we're getting it in under a minute. That kind of gives an idea of the speed of collection that's possible with, with high speed CMOS. What I want to talk about now are just some of the applications, the range of materials that this detector can be applied on. So, uh, and basically what I'm trying to show is, as materials get more difficult, is the high-speed CMOS still applicable? And I, I'm going to try to show that yes, it is. So this is a deformed ferritic sample. So as you deform a material, the bands are not as sharp. The, 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 the bands become more diffuse in the diffraction pattern. Uh, but we can, in this case, get 98% indexing. We see the deformation in the color. You see the subtle changes in coloring in the map correspond to the deformation within the grains. We see it in both the image quality and the Prius grayscale images, and we can quantify that in the orientation maps. If we look at it in a little bit more detail, if you look on the grain on the left-hand side of the map, I've drawn a little line that goes from the top to the bottom of the grain. Those crystals in there kind of show how the grain is rotating through there after deformation. And we can track with the distribution on the left the point-to-point -point and point-to-origin misorientations that occur. So you can see there's a point where the orientation changes 27 degrees within the single grain. And we can measure that with high precision point-to-point -point within the, the deformed microstructure. And we can quantify this a little bit more by looking at a piece of single crystal silicon and we measure an area here. You see we get precision values uh, where we're basically measuring the, the noise level of the measurements of under a tenth of a degree. In this case, it was 0.04 degrees uh, on, a, on a single crystal. So we can get high precision even at these high speed type configurations. This shows how it changes as we increase the deformation in, in more difficult samples. So this is looking at a, a piece of cold rolled brass. So as we, as we deform it cold, there's not a lot of recovery in the material. The, the, the dislocations that are introduced stay in the material. Those disrupt the lattice and the diffraction becomes not as sharp. That's what the patterns are trying to show here. The patterns are progressively coming a little bit worse. Um, but you can see, uh, even as we roll the material more and more, we're still getting very good characterization, even at 30% cold rolled deformation. So there's a lot of strain present in the material, uh, but we get good results. And we can see we can actually quantify the amount of plastic deformation or the amount of misorientations that are introduced if we plot it with the kernel average misorientation or CAN map of the detector. 
So it becomes less blue, more colored. We can, we can measure that deformation even at these high collection speeds. We can look at it in another way. This is titanium. So titanium is a non-cubic pattern. The structure becomes more complicated. Uh, the band detection becomes more important. We see that in the pattern in the bottom left. This is looking at it before deformation. So pretty equiax grains for the most part and, and look at it pretty well. If we bend it, so we bend the sample. On the left, it's pulled in tension. Uh, on the right-hand side, it's put in compression as we bend it. We can see the deformation that's present on both sides, and we can actually see the introduction of the twins, or the small parallel uh, grains that are introduced within those uh, larger, more equiac structure. And we can characterize those as tensile and compression uh, deformation twins. And we can also look at uh, multi-phases. So this is an example from uh, a dual-phase pipeline steel where we have FCC and BCC phases. We can measure these at high speed, so we can not only differentiate the orientations, we can differentiate the phases at high speeds. And we can also think about combining this with EDS. Our EDS detectors uh, have the highest input and output count rates. This allows us for high-speed simultaneous collection uh, so the velocity can be integrated with, with the, uh, the Octane Elect, Octane Elite detectors for high-speed operation. And why that's important is um, with EBSD, if things are similar crystallographically, so if you have two, say, FCC crystals, it's difficult for EBSD alone to differentiate those, those patterns. So the structure on the left shows the initial microstructure. You can see there's, there's grains of different sizes that are that change as we move, look across the, the screen uh, horizontally. In the middle, we see the EDS map. So copper is shaded red, nickel is shaded blue, and we see clear differentiation of where those are because of the, uh, the e EDS data. But if we look at the EBSD phase map on the right, we see it's very speckled. It can't pick those out particularly easy uh, with, with EBSD alone. But if we use the chemistry to guide this, which we call chi-scan, we can apply that, and now we see our phase map there after chi-scan on the left. Uh, we get very clear phase differentiation. Uh, in the middle now, we can look at our grain map where we group together these points uh, by orientation. We see where the grains are. We know what the grain size is. And then on the right now, we can do the grain size distribution of the copper and the nickel iron phase. So not only do we get the orientations, we get the grains, and we get them differentiated by phase we start to understand the grain growth mechanism for both phase, uh, phases independently to understand how the, the thermal cycling affected the, the layered structures. We can also apply some of our other unique technologies to this camera. So one is NPAR, where we average spatially the neighboring patterns with the collected pattern to improve the signal to noise. This is just an example from a deformed aluminum sample. So we have on the left the initial data collected at high speeds where our indexing success rate is about 85%. We apply NPAR to only the 15% of the points that have a low uh, confidence index to start. After we apply that, we get 97% indexing success rate, and you can see the improvement in pattern quality by using NPAR. And we can also use what we call Prius, which is our, our imaging system using our EBSD detector as an uh, SEM imaging tool we do that but by defining uh, different regions within our phosphor screen as electron imaging counters. And we can monitor the signal as we raster across the screen to create an image. So this is just an example from a, a piece of quartz where we can see the Prius on the bottom, the middle, and the top map. Uh, the bottom we generally try to see a little bit more topography. In the center we generally see more orientation contrast. And on the top, we see more atomic number contrast, similar to a traditional backscattered electron detector. And we can correlate that to our regular EBSD data. If you look on the one on the right, and I toggle that back and forth, you can see how the high-intensity Prius images correspond to the, uh, the higher aluminum concentration regions within the quartz. We get good orientation data in there. We resolve the twins in there. And we can, we can see how the orientation contrast uh, corresponds to the orientation maps. Uh, this is also an example that shows it can be used in, in a low vacuum condition. Because we're collecting uh, a large amount of data now quicker, we can think about how we can change our data collection strategies.
This is just an example looking at a, a large area sample. You can see on the scale marker there, that's five millimeters showing. So we're looking at centimeter scale characterization where we're automatically uh, montaging the area of interest and stitching it together with a feature that we call combo scan. Um, this is a great microstructure for it because uh, there are many different spatial uh, resolution scales. It's basically centimeter to nanometer scale characterization. Uh, so with, with the camera, we can collect data with very small resolution covering a very large area. Another example of this is measuring retained austenite in some of the steel samples. So retained austenite occurs as you uh, cool uh, material from the FCC phase to the BCC phase. Depending on the cooling rate, the amount of uh, retained austenite uh, will influence your final mechanical properties. So being able to understand that's important, but if we look at the phase map on the left, you can see the, uh, the austenite distribution is non-uniform. So if you really want to measure this, you kind of want to get a, a good area statistical collection to be able to see where it's present. But to do that, because it forms in small sizes, you need to look at with a pretty fine step size. So in this case, it's about a 100 nanometer step size uh, covering a, a very large area. So this is about 30 million data points for what we term the needle in the haystack problem. And you're able to start to see on, on the image on the right those, those patches of color um, that correspond just to the austenite. We start to see where the austenite packet structures are uh, within the, the, um, the ferritic mi microstructure. And we can also have a sample like this where it has a bimodal grain size of very small grains and very large grains. If we want to measure that grain size, our step size has to be small enough to resolve the small grains. Uh, so in this case, we can measure um, a weld interface where we can get enough uh, data resolution that we can measure both the small grains and the large grains uh, across the weld interface. This is about 7 million point data size. And we can get the grain size distribution for both. And we can start thinking about partitioning this because the, the red grains there on the right correspond to the, the base metal. The blue grains there correspond to the weld nugget and understanding the grain size difference between those is important for understanding the, the weld parameters and how it affects the resulting microstructure. So with that, that's sort of covering the, uh, the evolution, how EBSD detector technology has sort of progressed from CMOS to, or from CCD to CMOS. Renee will now take over to cover the next step in, in pattern development. Thank you, Matt. Um, so that was the, the evolution part um, to the CMOS, high speed, and as I say here, the EBSD detector development over the last, let's say, 30 years has really been focused on, on speed and, and usability. So improving the detector speed, allowing you to go faster and faster to have just more uh, use of your EBSD and SEM time. Now, there are alternative detection, alternative detection methods that I'm going to talk about here with the direct electron detection. And I would like to show you some examples of what this detector can do and how it can help us looking at a different kind of analysis of EBSD patterns. But before I do that, um, let me go back into the history a little bit um, because we're going full circle almost. This is a, an image from the 1970s. This is direct electron detection but not on a, an electronic uh, medium, but on film. So the early EBSD patterns were always collected on film. And if you're really good, you could do, what is it, 10 patterns per hour, <laughs> if you're lucky. So we have progressed a little bit. But if you look at the quality of these patterns, they were fantastic. There's a lot of detail in there. And in those days, the patterns were mainly used for crystallographic analysis, just trying to understand the structure, the crystal structure, the unit cell of the materials. And then um, in the mid to late 80s, um, we moved over to analog television cameras. So we started with these really nice uh, patterns on film. And then later on, we moved and we accepted patterns like this one on the right. They're pretty horrible. Those are television rate cameras, so we could not set the frame rate. And it was fixed here in the US, 30 frames per second. In Europe, 25. So you could, have, you could go faster than we could. But we had to average quite a lot of frames to get something usable. So let's say typically 8 to 16 frames were averaged to allow you to get indexable patterns. Then in the late 90s, um, improvements in these analog cameras came about. So there we have a, a nicer pattern. 
and these were replaced by digital cameras and slow speed cameras. And this slow speed is a little bit of a misnomer perhaps, because what it means is that it allows us to set the exposure time. So the television cameras have a fixed frame rate, like your television set, and the digital slow speed cameras allow us to say any frame rate from a few millisecond exposure time to 10 or 20 second exposure time if you want to. And that really improved the quality of the patterns dramatically. And then of course, as Matt just showed, the CMOS, so the evolution from the CCD cameras to CMOS gives you really nice patterns as well at much higher speeds. Now, what do all these, these cameras, these detectors have in common? You have on the right hand side, there's the sample at the 70 degree tilt. Then we have either recording film or a phosphor screen where the electrons are transformed into light. That goes through some kind of optical pathway, in this case here, a LED glass into the camera that's behind it. Analog camera, CCD, CMOS, whatever. And as I said, this focus on speed, that was the main development from, let's say, the late mid 80s to now. As I just showed you, new sensors, the pattern quality improved, we could go much faster, the phosphor screen has improved, the lenses have improved. Um, and just look at the speed of acquisition. So there, um, 1993, that was one point a second when we were lucky, uh, sometimes one point every three seconds. And right now we can go over 4,500 points a second. That, that brings also a little bit of responsibility to the user. Um, in the early days, until, well, what's early days? Maybe two years ago. Um, EBSD users were typically moved into the night. <laughs> when you're in your lab, you have multiple users. EBSD takes a long time. So, yeah, you come in at 7 uh, p.m., you work overnight, come back in the morning and see you. Um, when you do four and a half thousand points per second and you let it run for an hour, you're collecting a 16 million point data set. That's really nice for this needle in the haystack problem, but it's also going to pose some challenges in the post-processing. So you really need to start thinking very carefully what you really want to measure. So you can measure much more than you could in the past. So we have smaller step sizes, maybe larger areas, but the scanning strategy is really important. So let's get back to this. So there's the, the history with this optical pathway to, to the detector. And what does that mean? It means that there are quite a few steps for the signal that we are generating on the sample to get detected. And there are some types of distortions that we're getting in the EBSD patterns. And there's some optical distortion, so those are the typical lens effects that you can have. There's a barrel distortion, concussion. Then there are other lens artifacts, spherical aberration, chromatic, astigmatism. We know all these from the electromagnetic lenses, but you have the same thing also in the optical uh, lenses that we're using for these cameras. So when you are interested in looking at small detail in the EBSD patterns, looking at maybe small deformations in there, how sure are we that what we see is real and what we see is perhaps affected by some of these artifacts? Then there's another one that is maybe less obvious, and that's the scintillator, the phosphor screen. There's also some effects um, on that. And one is the, the wavelength. So depending on what composition of phosphor you're using, you get a different type of light. It gives a different sensitivity to the camera behind it. And there's the thickness variation and the grain size variation on the phosphor screen itself, which sort of smooths out the signal. And it removes a little bit of the sharpness that you may get in your diffraction pattern. So that's what I meant here by this revolution for EBSD detector technology, going to the direct electron detection. We're just cutting off whatever here is in front, replace the TV camera with a chip, and the electrons go directly onto that chip. So there is a, these are actually two patterns from minerals. The one on the left is a garnet, and on the right is enstatite. So there's a lot of detail, as you can see, in these patterns, and there is no distortion. This is as is. So there's no phosphorus screen anymore? No. no. There's a chip. Yes. This for the direct, for the normal CMOS, there is a phosphor screen. For a direct electron detection, there's no phosphor screen anymore. So we remove the optical path. So we take away any of these distortions, potential artifacts. <clears throat> and it's, of course, it's not a new thing. 
if we walk around the show floor here, there are lots of other suppliers that offer direct electron detection, but those are typically for TEM applications, low dose applications, biological. Um, it has been shown to work for eBSD as well. Uh, about six, seven years ago, there were some groups in the UK, in Glasgow, they were working on it. Um, but there were some problems. One is the cost. TEM cameras, direct electron cameras are not cheap. And putting those in a potentially uh, dangerous place in an SEM, I'm not sure if your lab manager would like that, if you would do that. Um, the other thing was the sensor geometry, the printed circuit board. So how do you put the board close to your sample? You need some clamping um, to get the proper solid angle, to get enough information to get EBSD indexing. And there was the temperature. So some of these chips can get quite hot. You put them exactly in the middle of the, uh, the vacuum chamber. So you need a way to remove the heat that is generated in, uh, in the assembly. So now we've built a direct electron detector. It's um, a number of chips. In this case, we have two by two, so an array of four chips, 512 by 512 um, pixels with a single layer of silicon on the front and it's a passive cooling system going out of the chamber. So it's a stable cooling, um, no problems with the higher temperature in the camera, in the chamber anymore. Now, just a, a close up. There on the top, it's partly cut out. You can see the silicon layer that's on the front. That's where the electrons hit the detector. Then underneath, there's a connection to the chip. And then the chips underneath with the little wires on the side going to the electronics. So that's, that's the chip itself, that's the sensor. So that's what we put very close to the sample in the traditional EBSD geometry. And here's just a, a picture. Um, I uh, photoshopped the sample in place because in this case, my stage is mounted on the door. So if I open the door, not much I can see. So but that's where the sample would be. The detector gets very close to get our normal 70 to 75 degrees solid angle which means that the perpendicular distance from the sample to the detector is about 20 millimeters. So that, that's how close we get. And here on the left, I have a, a little animation of, of how the detector actually works. So we see the, uh, the layer on the top with the bonds that I showed here, the bump bonds. Um, and there's a charge event, an electron hits it. There's a little bias voltage. Charge goes down, hits the amplifier, so it's magnified. Then the software checks, okay. Um, we check, is this a real signal? So there's a threshold, there's a cutoff value to take the noise away. So whatever real signal is above the noise, and then we can just count the event, which means that for every pixel, we can actually count how many electrons come in. And when you do that, you can just run it as a normal EBSD detector. So maybe not the most efficient use of such a system, but you have, can get pretty nice maps. Um, this is a duplex uh, material, austenite ferritic steel, lots of deformation, and there we just have a few maps as Matt showed that we also get with the velocity detector. But we can do a little bit more than that. And what I show here is event counting. So the top layer, the top row shows patterns collected at 10 kV with 380 picoamp of beam current, so it's quite a bit less than what we normally use. The bottom row, 20 kV, 450 picoamps. And the other numbers you see, 50, 80, 110, is the maximum number of electrons in any one pixel in that pattern. So if we look on the top left, we have a pattern with 50. That means that I have a maximum number of electrons or counts, maximum 50 pixels, 50 electrons in any one pixel. And that's the type of pattern you get. It also directly shows you that the diffraction is only a small component of the entire signal on the detector. Typically between 10 and 20% gives you the bands. The other 80% um, is just background noise. So the bands are, are pretty weak. But then we just I, uh, increase exposure time, 10, 20, 60 milliseconds. So let's increase that a bit more. 300 milliseconds, so you can see the contrast and the, the quality of the pattern uh, increasing. You start to see a lot of detail already, um, especially in the top row. If you go 10 kV, there is uh, very nice detail visible. 
when the bands go narrower with higher uh, KV, you lose that a little bit, but still there's a lot of uh, information in there. And when you go up to, t in this case, to one second for these counts, for these uh, beam currents, you get very high quality diffraction patterns. And this low current is also something we can use for mapping. So if you have beam sensitive materials, you could map with just a few hundred picoamp of current in order to um, save your material. Uh, this material, I'll immediately admit, it's not beam sensitive, it's a duplex steel, but just to show uh, what it can do. This has 110 picoamp um, beam current, which means it's one third of the one on the top left. So it's not much. And here you see the original pattern, top right, you can just make out the bands, but for the band detection algorithms, for the half transform, that is enough to identify where the bands are. And we can actually get a pretty good uh, map and phase separation based on these conditions. Now, that's what you can do with mapping. But now let's take a look at the patterns themselves. And here we have a pattern on a nickel test sample collected on a Hikari, on a CCD camera, so not a CMOS, um, just to get a good quality pattern. I would say that looks pretty nice. So if you get a pattern like that from a sample, everybody's happy, I would assume. And then I just let the sample in place, take the detector off, and move the direct electron in place. And that's the difference between the two. So what, what you immediately see is the sharpness of the bands. On, on the left hand side you see a lot of the bands are a little bit blurry at the edges and also the detail inside is not very sharp and on the right it is. So that's, that's really the effect of the phosphor screen and the optical pathway that the signal has to travel to get into the CCD. And we can look at a little bit more detail here. So there's a, a recrystallized ferritic grain. You see a lot of detail. You can see the higher order reflections very nicely in this band that goes away to the top left. And there's just a few zone axes indicated. And we now retract the detector. So we zoom into this pattern. Just take a look at the detail that we can find. So this is taking the detector about 10 centimeters out. Gives me, uh, what was it, about 20 degrees solid angle that I have left over. But here you can see the effects of the overlap of the different bands, um, of the details of the diffraction um, in that particular 3, 2, 1 zone axis. Then I can try to compare that with a dynamic simulation, just to see are these simulations any good? Do they really show what we get? And you can see here, um, on the right, it's the same area, same um, experimental or mathematical conditions. Uh, the contrast is, like, is a bit different, but most of the details you can see fit very nicely. The main thing that you may, may notice here is that the simulation looks a little bit unsharp compared to the live one. And that is probably because we are allowing too many low energy electrons to contribute, which cause the bands to vary in width, that's a high tension effect uh, with a Bragg angle, and that were, that's what we see here. So we'd have to play a little bit with that. You can actually use this to estimate the penetration depth and the energy of the electrons that are actually coming out of your sample. So there is zooming in, just look at the details. In, in most cases, I can't really pointed anything here, but you can see some of the, the triangles and the arrows, let's say, that you are forming on the patterns are matching very nicely with what we see in the simulation. Now then there's another one. Um, I couldn't resist when I saw this pattern. It had the 111 zone axis exactly in the, um, in the pattern center, so where the electrons hit the uh, screen perpendicularly, so slightly above the middle. And when I zoom into that one, that's um, a zone axis with a three-fold symmetry. And we just see the, the big triangle now disappear because we are zooming out. And if you look carefully, you see these, these six or these three bands that are forming this the almost six-fold symmetry. You can recognize the differences. Uh, but yeah, I can't really point at it. But the one on the top there formed like an arrow going down. And the one to the left 
is more like a half an ellipse. So you can actually see if you look at the details in the, the brighter parts on the circle. That's what I'm looking now. There, I mean, I mean this, this more of less elliptical shape or this arrow shape that I have here. Just see if you can follow. If you take it here, there we have this ellipse again. There we have the arrow again. There's the ellipse again. And here's the arrow again. So you can really see it's not, not six-fold symmetry. The three-fold is really following out of the details that we can get in this pattern. Now, another thing you can do is you can look at the thresholding um, for the, the pattern detection, for the pixel detection, and you can tell the software, okay, remove the low energy electrons. So let's see if we can um, optimize or, or maybe filter out the, the low energy ones. Um, and on the left is basically all the electrons with more than 5 kV energy. On the right, anything larger than 17 kV. Um, difference is not as big as I expected initially, I have to say. If I zoom in a little bit, um, there are a few places where you, can, where you can just see that the 17 kV gets a little bit sharper but it's not much. Now, the other thing um, that we often see in diffraction patterns when we are looking um, in a normal CCD or CMOS camera is that we see that the patterns get a little bit unsharp towards the corners or towards the edges of the phosphor screen. And in many cases, that is assigned to optical artifacts. There must be something in the camera, so let's ignore that. But if I look here, you can see that in the middle of the pattern, it's nice and sharp. And towards the edge, it gets a little bit worse. Not that much. This is a recrystallized platinum. But what happens is that you can see that here in the green drawing, depending on, on where the electrons go through the sample, there's a different path length in the specimen. The shorter the path length, the shorter the, or the less the amount of, of deformation in the unit cell that we're getting, and the sharper the pattern. So the more towards the corners, much longer path length in the sample and if I go to a deformed material so in the middle it's not so sharp as before but towards the corners it gets really blurry so that's really an effect of the longer pathway in the specimen and we can exclude any effects of the phosphor screen or optical pathway um, from here uh, just another one that was platinum that doesn't show it so clearly this is niobium carbide and in the middle, both patterns are nice and sharp, and towards the edges, you lose everything. And that is, that is really an effect of the travel of the electrons. Now, another experiment I did here was looking at the specimen tilt, because that affects this path length in the sample. So, for example, if I take a sample at 60 degree tilt, um, the electrons going to the bottom of the pattern have a much longer way to travel in the specimen than towards the top. If I go to 70 degree tilt, that gets less steeper. 80 degree tilt, they get very similar. So let's try that. This is a pattern collected at 85 degree tilt. So you can actually do EBSD from 85 to 50. You don't have to go to 70 degrees, it's quite flexible. But this is 85 degrees, and I tilted it back to 50, and I tried to keep the same zone axis in the field of view. So it, it will jump a little bit because you have to move the sample quite a bit and find the same grain again. But this is just going down now with less and less tilt to 50 degrees. And you can see that towards the, the edges again, it gets a little bit unsharp. And if you go to the bottom of the pattern now, you see that the contrast in the bands is inverting. The bands are getting darker. And that's also an effect of the, the travel range in the specimen. It's actually, that is also something that you can see in transmission EBSD. The thicker the sample, when it gets too thick at some point, contrast inverts and the bands get dark. You get the same thing when you tilt not too far, typically 40 to 50 degrees. So there's the, the same sequence again from 50 degrees top left to 85 uh, bottom right. And at 50 degrees, perhaps towards the edges gets a little bit um, less sharp. <clears throat> when I look at a deformed material, already here you can see that the center is sharper, especially compared to the bottom. And when I tilt, do the same experiment here, you see that you just lose the signal towards the bottom and also towards the top it really gets unsharp, out of focus.
And that is really an effect of the travel of the electrons in your sample. Now, the, the atomic number of your material also has an effect on, on what EBSD patterns look like. Um, if you have experimented with different types of samples, you've seen that as well. The heavier the material, the higher the contrast, but also a little bit unsharpness that you get. That's an effect of the diffraction uh, parameters. So if I look here at the platinum, gold, tungsten, there's a lot of detail in these patterns, but the patterns are not really crisp, not really sharp. And if I go to lower atomic numbers, iron, the silicon, and aluminium, beryllium, then the bent edges get much thinner and gets much sharper. Uh, that's an effect of the atomic number and of the diffraction uh, physics that is going on. But again, it's something that you can start quantifying without having to take into account any of the other potential uh, detector artifacts. So just to summarize that, there you have now developed a new direct electron detector in a normal EBSD detector geometry. So you could just replace, like here, a velocity put the direct electron on and start working with that. It is suitable for EBSD mapping. It's very sensitive. You can, with less than few, or fewer than 50 electrons per pixel, you can get indexable diffraction patterns. So that would be very useful for beam sensitive materials. And because there is no artifacts or no distortions on the way from the sample to the detective, to the, to the detector screen, um, you can do all kinds of quantitative pattern analysis that you could not easily do with a traditional detector. So, just a few more pretty pictures. Thank you very much for your attention.